Hello. Can you all hear me? Thumbs up? Somebody? Great, good. So welcome to our, our program tonight. This is our second event in the Big Read program with Tim O'Brien on the things they carried in its 30th year since publication. Amazing. Um, I'm Dr. Alex Vernon. I work at Hendricks College. I'm professor of English at Hendricks College up in Conway. Uh, and, and tonight is going to be a conversation really between Tim and I. It's sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts and Arts Midwest as a part of Big Read Cows. Special thanks to Nate Coulter, Mark Christ, Brad Moy, and Nathan Smith for everything they have done to make tonight possible. We conducted another event with Tim O'Brien last month in October, and it's my understanding that both will be available on the web afterwards if you want to come back and, and listen or share with others. Last month's event concentrated on Tim O'Brien's uh, book of fiction, The Things They Carried. Tonight, he wanted to do something different. Tim has spoken about this book and answered questions hundreds of times over the past 30 years since it came out. He just finished a big read on this book um, with another city for three more days talking about this book. Um, so he asked that he and I have a conversation. We're both two combat veterans from different American wars and we both write about war. Um, so he thought it'd be, it would be fun and, and insightful if the two of us just had a conversation and you all got to eavesdrop in. Um, having said that, Please use your chat. Um, I'm gonna have the chat open and monitoring it. So that way I can feel, forward some of your questions to, to Tim um, and ask those questions of him as well, in addition to my questions for him. So as you probably know, Tim served in Vietnam from 1969 to 1970. And then as you probably don't know, I served in the Persian Gulf War, 1990 and 1991. Tim's a novelist who has written both fiction and nonfiction about his war. I'm an English professor who has written nonfiction about my war and have also studied 20th century war writing and film, including Tim's work. Another thing I would add too is that Tim and I have known each other for about 17 years, um, and particularly in the last several years, we've gotten to know each other better. Um, and I say this just because our, our, our tone might get have a certain ease to it, <laughs> right? Um, and a kind of joking mood to it. So, so just so you sort of know where that's coming from. Um, and if I'm not careful, he's going to try to ask me more questions than I can ask of him. So please, again, use your Zoom um, to use the chat at the bottom so that I can have your questions to pepper him with as well, too. So it's as, as with a month ago and as with always when I introduce Tim, it's, it's a great thrill and honor to introduce Tim. Um, the Big Read program focuses on his fifth book, probably his, his best known book, The Things They Carried which is a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. It has since become the most widely read literary work from the war in Vietnam. It's the most requested title by local communities for big read programs like ours. And according to one data set, it's the most taught US novel in higher education English courses around the globe. His most recent book came out almost exactly a year ago. Um, if the things they carried hovers between novel and memoir, the new one, Dad's Maybe Book, hovers between memoir and essay collection. It's a, it's a fantastic book. It's kind of a, a conversation. If tonight is a conversation between Tim and I, the new book is kind of a conversation between Tim and his two sons, the kind of conversation he's having his, with his two sons so that when they are, when they are, they're both teenagers now, but when they are, you know, full adults, um, they understand a little bit better what went on through their father's mind um, all those years. Um, so it's, it's a great book. Dad's maybe book, check it out from a Cal's branch or, call up your local independent bookstore to, to order it and read it. Um, and without further ado, we, I will um, open this up to a conversation with Tim. So Tim, welcome from Austin, great. Texas. It's great to be here. For the audience members, Alex and I have become really good friends over the years. Uh, in particular, particularly over the past uh, maybe two years, he has been working on a biography of me which is trying to breathe life into it. This guy who all he does is sit in front of a computer all day. Uh, unlike, you know, say Ernest Hemingway, who would go shoot elephants. Uh, I, I just sit in my underwear looking at a, at a computer screen. I'm going to start the conversation off by asking Alex a question. Uh, in the eyes of Orion, which uh, uh, is Alex's nonfiction book about his own experience uh, in war, Alex offers his readers a nonfiction account of the experience of experiences of five young lieutenants serving, I believe, if I remember correctly, as platoon leaders in the same tank battalion. 
during the Gulf War, uh, during which actual uh, combat operations occurred in early 1991. So Alex is about to celebrate his 30th anniversary uh, of war. Among those five lieutenants is a guy named Alex Vernon, and thus parts of the book are quite personal. And I have a number of questions that uh, I've been curious about for years, and I've never asked Alex, and I'm going to try to get at least a few of them out tonight. If I remember correctly, uh, four of the five lieutenants in the eyes of Orion were graduates of West Point. Is that correct? And the fifth, yes, and the fifth, I believe, was a, a ROTC officer. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Um, so my question is, in what ways and to what extent uh, did your schooling at West Point shape your opinions, your judgments, and your recollections about the combat experience? And as part of the same question or related to that question, do you think that enlisted men, that is those soldiers who were not officers, uh, held roughly the same opinions, made roughly the same judgments about the war. But the first part of it is for me the most interesting. I'm curious as to what extent West Point influenced how you experienced the war and how you remember it. I, wow. Um, <laughs> you should have sent me that one ahead of time, man. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a large question. So I guess I should preface you know, the, my war was, as you said, was 30 years ago. And, and I wrote that book 20, 25 years ago. Um, and so as you, as you have trouble with remembering sometimes, I don't remember back. And, and I don't actually think about much of that part of my life much at all. I mean, if you, if you talk to my wife or friends, they would say I never talk about it. I think they would say that. Um, and so I don't think about it much. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's an old version of me. Um, and so I think about my todays, right, and my futures, my tomorrows, much more so than I do do those years. Um, in terms in terms of the West Point question, I don't know that that. Um, I mean, certainly, we were. It's a professional school. I mean, it's 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 a vocational school, right? I mean, the purpose of West Point is to train army officers, and so it's a vocational school, and so it's a professional school, and it was you know it's a school and a and a military that was largely reinvented after your war, Tim, um, to try to address some of some of the issues, I guess. Um, so I think a lot of, I guess, hmm, I don't know if it affects, if West Point affects my memory of the war at all. Um, I might certainly change as a human being since the war. And so that affects the way I think about the war, especially. Um, and I suppose I would say that one thing was that, you know, when we were at school, it was interesting because people outside of, of the military academy would talk about, oh, you might be a colonel or a general someday. But inside school, all people talked about was being a platoon leader. Like that, that, that was the, the end all and be all is to be a, be a platoon leader, you know, potentially a combat platoon leader. And that was sort of the end point was that person, right? Leading, leading soldiers in the front line. Um, and so in some ways, that's where my imagination was more about was sort of that that experience, not so much someday being a colonel or general or whatever, which I obviously got out way before that <laughs> ever possibly, <laughs> possibly happened. Um, in terms of in terms of whether enlisted folks had the same thoughts about as, as about the war as officers, I, I mean, not, not even all the officers had monolithic thoughts about it, right? I mean, there's many opinions about the wars, my wars, there were officers in, in the military. And so I think the same probably obtains with obtains with the enlisted folks, there were gung-ho officers, there were gung-ho enlisted guys, there were, you know, people like me who were not so gung-ho, who were officers and, and not so gung-ho enlisted folks. Um, so um, I think that's, there, there are too many, I think maybe one, of course, one difference is that my, with my war, it was an all-volunteer force as opposed to your war, right? Um, and so that clearly made a difference. I mean, nobody could complain that they were at some level were doing something against their wishes, right? And so I think that fundamentally, but, but having said that, you know, jokes I've read in your works were some of the same jokes I read in my works, where if somebody was screwing around, they would say, what are they going to do, send me to Iraq, right? Just as, just as folks in your war would say, what are they going to do, send me to Vietnam? Um, so some of the same kind of, same kind of jokes and sentiments were there. Um, 
But again, we, we, we were all volunteers in a way that you, were, you definitely were not, too. Did you, uh, when you were in that tank and you were engaged in combat operations, as a lieutenant, did you think about it as, as a military problem? Like what tactics and uh, machinery and orders and, or did you, did only a portion of you think of it as a military man and partly as a, a, an afraid human being? And how did you blend those two things? I mean, you did have to tell men what to do. Yeah, I always, it's always interesting. My, my, I was a, was a tank platoon leader, so I had four M1, A1 Abrams tanks um, and, and the, the crews that went with them, obviously. Um, and our battalion motto was always oxymoronically, if that's the right word, um, contradictory, mission first, men always, right? Wow. Which, which sort of speaks to that balance you're talking about, right? And that's certainly something I know you've written about in some of your books, right? How do, how do officers do that? How, do, how does anybody do that, right? Yeah. Sort of make that, make that balance. Um, and I guess the answer is, hmm, I don't know. I mean, you, you, I tried to do both. I mean, it was a military operation, but, you know, I was scared to death. Um, and, you know, what, that we were facing at the time, the fourth largest army in the world that with chemical and nuclear and biological or chemical and biological um, capacity that, that, that the army had used before. So I was scared out of my mind. Um, and um, so it was both a technical problem, but also, but also a very human problem too um, of, you know, not, not wanting to hurt people and have people get hurt right. um, and yet being where I was. So, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Sort of the, the well, last, I mean, the last component of this question, I'll give you the third and then you will drop that subject, but uh, I'm just curious to ask you, um, yeah. were you aware as a Lieutenant in a tank rolling through the desert of what, part you were playing in any larger tactical operation. Um, I mean, I've read online and I've read in your book partly and also other sources that, for example, one unit that went in early uh, into Iraq was engaged in a feint, that is to distract the Iraqis. Uh, while meanwhile, another unit was making a large kind of left hook sweep. Were you aware of that kind of large tactical stuff on the large scale or just your own tactical stuff, what you were doing in your tank at that given moment? How much were you aware of the big yeah. picture? Um, certainly um, before, before LD, right? Our military speak a line of departure before we you know, attacked into Iraq on February 24th, um, we had been briefed on the plans, the overall plan. The, I mean, the briefings had come all the way down, you know, from General Schwarzkopf, I suppose, you know, down the different levels. And so we had a, we had a meeting with battalion, maybe even a brigade meeting, I don't remember that well, in the desert where we got a sense of the overall plan. And they had an enormous, enormous sandbox board. So we knew we, I was in the famous left hook, so we knew that's where we were. We knew that there were going to be operations to our east. We had a general sense of that. Um, yeah, and there may have been, I don't remember, there may have been things we did not quite know because they weren't going to tell us in case we wrote home. As I recall, some of the bigger briefings, they waited till fairly late to tell us, as I recall, right? It's just, I suppose, for, for operational security. Um, I don't really remember. Um, certainly for my, for the book that I wrote, um, I had to do additional research. I mean, I did not know everything at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and to tell a story, especially a story of not just my memories, but I'm trying to weave together a story of five different lieutenants. I felt like I had to tell the bigger picture and to do that, I had to do some research to know more than I knew at the time. Right. Or certainly mm -hmm. remember. So I had to do some of that research to get that kind of historical picture. Um, so I, I mean, I think generally speaking, we had a pretty good idea. I mean, once it started for a few days, it was fast and furious. And I don't know that we got many updates that I, I mean, again, it was 30 years ago, but um, so, but, but yeah, I mean, going into it, we generally had an idea of, of what our role was in the larger picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just on a personal basis, what, 
were you inside the tank all the time or were you outside of it most as you're rumbling through the desert or were you looking out, you know, your head out the hatch? And if yeah, your yeah. head isn't out the hatch and you're always in the tank, what do you what do you see? I mean, how do you, other tanks with you? How do you how do you not run into them and things like that? Oh, we almost did run into them once. Um, so, so yeah. So the so the tank. The tank. I was as a platoon leader. I was one of the tank commanders of my four tanks. So my head can be sticking up out right most of the time. Um, we you could be all the way buttoned up, so the hatch is closed and you're inside. And when you're buttoned up, you have essentially periscopes that you can sort of look through, but they are covered in dust because we're in the middle of the desert and vision is horrible, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can also be, oh, what, was that, what was that called? So that was buttoned up. There's also, there's a, a way you could be, have your, have your um, hatch open right above your head so you could like stick up a little bit of your head to look out. So your visibility is better, but not great, but you're more protected. Or you could have your hatch all the way open and be sticking up essentially waist high. Um, and so, I mean, just depending upon what was happening, you'd be in, in different positions, right? And so it's, um, I, I did not ever button up all the way because you just can't see, right? You just, yeah. you, it's, yeah. it's too hard to know. Um, I will say though, that our first night um, of attack was, we attacked at night to take advantage of our night technology. And it was a rainstorm and windstorm and dust storm. So it was, I mean, trying to see where you were was incredibly difficult. So we, my tank almost did run into another tank. And I, just, I can remember just sort of seeing this tank out of nowhere, inches from my tank. And I told my driver to swerve. And he oh, no. right. so, so yeah, we had, I mean, there were, I'm sure there were other close calls like that too. Um, but it was, it was really hard mm -hmm. to see. Absolutely. Yeah. So questions for you, <laughs> or maybe for both of us too. I mean, I'm, I'm reading the questions that people are, are asking. Um, one person has asked on the chat about, and I'm sure you've been asked this many, many times, Tim, about when you, when you write about war, having written about war, how therapeutic is it to do? I mean, cathartic is a word people use a lot. Um, and and so, so people are asking, if, when we write about war, you and I, is it, is it therapeutic in some fashion? I have uh, two answers to the question and they're contradictory. And I mean, directly contradictory. On the one hand, when I'm actually composing sentences, all I think about is the sentence and what's behind the sentence. It's as if on the screen, there's a sentence on the computer. And behind the screen, there's a face or faces and there are, there are things happening. So my attention is going partly on the sentence, just the words I'm putting down and how well they express and how freshly they express and how gracefully they express what I'm seeing beyond the screen. Uh, that's not therapeutic at all. That's just hard labor. Um, should I write that word or that word or that word or none of them? And should I even write a sentence that requires one of those three words? It's, it's, a, it's, it's on writing. However, the second part of my answer, which is contradictory, is that I do think in the end, the experience of doing it is therapeutic uh, in, a, in a modest way. It'll never, my books will never erase the horror that visits me to this day at, you know, two in the morning. It's never, it's not going to eradicate it. It's not going to temper it. Uh, nor should it, really. Um, I think it's good to remember bad stuff that you participated in, as opposed to eradicate it or somehow erase it through some memory wipe device. That's true of life in general. We all have joyous, wonderful experiences. We all have really sad, horrible experiences. And in between, we all have kind of wash the dishes experiences that are just boring. Um, and I don't think a, a, a full human being should 
try to erase that which is which wakes you up in the late in the night or what makes you stare at your plate when you're eating dinner as you sort of go back to something it doesn't have to be war it can be you know a divorce or it can be a a dead father it can be all kinds of things but there's a, a kind of a myth or a psychological psychiatric illusion that somehow we should put things behind us and that to me seems the abs the opposite of learning and of growing as a human being through things that didn't go so well um, things that were tragedies in one's life uh, the word healing is almost always used for veterans you know let's heal from our post-traumatic stress syndrome but i'm i don't quite buy it that i or at least the kind of healing that involves uh putting it behind you or forgetfulness or a kind of in, imposed volitional amnesia i don't believe in that i think we need to remember uh the good and the bad to be full human beings i'm not sure that chipmunks or gophers or raccoons remember the bad stuff for long i don't think they do or the good stuff for long i think for them they live almost entirely in the present and if that's what healing means i want no part of it so yeah i think it has lightened the load my writing a little bit but only modestly uh it's never going to eradicate the bad stuff but it does lighten the load a little bit by uh, putting experience on the page. How do you feel about it, Alex? I mean, I think the same, right? I mean, on, on the one level, as you say, when you're when you're writing a sentence, you're writing a sentence, and you're you're thinking about a thousand things. But it's all about craft. It's not about other things. Um, as with as with you, my first book was was the war memoir, um, and so in some ways, I wrote a second military memoir also after that um in some ways it relieved me of the responsibility of having to remember because it was on paper i mean I'd, I'd done that i'd done that hard memory work right that hard chronological work and sort of done all that work so it relieved me of, of that pressure to, to have to remember um and and as i said before i don't really think about my war that much um but i would say in terms of that kind of open-endedness that you talked about I entirely agree, and sort of what's interesting to me is, is you know, so you know, one of the words people people bat around these days is not PTSD as much, well, in addition to PTSD, of moral injury, right? Um, and and to me, for for me, that sense of moral injury is what has probably increased over the years. The further distance I get, the further the older I get, the further understanding I have. Um, so. Um, I don't know if this relates to moral injury, but the one thing I've been thinking about lately is, as I as I think about you and I both and our overlapping experiences, um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, um, and mostly in the 70s, um, and so my war movies were not that different from yours, right? I had those 70s World War II movies that were, you know, countering the Vietnam lost war narrative, um, mm -hmm. and and so like when I talk to my college students now about whether they would ever think about the military, most say no. And I say, why? And they say, we know how awful it is because we've seen platoon. <laughs> right? we've seen platoon. But platoon was not my childhood movie. My childhood movies were a little bit more great war kind of movies, right? Um, um, the good war, World War II kind of movies as, as you had. And sort of thinking about the ways in which, in which I was influenced by things going on around me ahead of time right um even mm -hmm. before my military experience um i'm doing more of i suppose i suppose as i get older so therapeutic only in the sense that i don't feel like i have to write it down or think about it because i've already done that work um but again i mean it's all still it's all still there right um and i don't i don't want it to go away i don't want to feel like it's it's resolved somehow i don't like resolution it's too it's too neat and tidy um mm -hmm. i think um somebody asked how especially given the two of us are talking having this conversation from two different wars the, the question of how wars have stayed the same and how they've changed right because i think i think both those statements are totally true right they, they there's a sameness to them all and yet they're they're all different also um how, how would you approach that question tim 
exactly as you just expressed it. They're all the same and they're all different. Uh, war is ultimately another wor word for, or kind of almost a euphemism for killing people. And uh, that hasn't changed war by war. Um, that there are all kinds of ways we justify it. Some interesting and maybe correct ways, other ways not so interesting and not so correct. Uh, but in the end, that remains the same. The, uh, and I don't mean that in any moral judgment sort of way, I just mean it in a factual way that you don't uh, practice military maneuvers to unkill people, you practice it to kill people. Uh, the, your war, my war, and the later war in the Middle East, the one we're still enduring in a kind of toned down way now, but it's still going on. Uh, there are many similarities and many big differences, just as you said. The biggest difference is that in your war and in the war going on now, uh, people weren't drafted, they weren't conscripted, they didn't go against their wills. And that makes not only for a different kind of army, it makes for a different kind of experience when you're in the war. Uh, I was, I went from my war, what's kicking and screaming? Uh, I opposed it. Uh, and yet I ended up going anyway for a variety of reasons, mainly a kind of a fear of not going, a fear of embarrassment in my hometown. And what will people think of me for refusing to go, heading to Canada? So I went out, I, I went, I nearly died out of embarrassment. You know that phrase, die of embarrassment? Mm -hmm. Because I went to war so I wouldn't be embarrassed. And uh, felt that way pretty much through the entire experience. There were occasions of lightheartedness and fraternity with my friends in the army. Uh, there were moments of even great joy when you least expect it. After a firefight and you're still alive, there's this incredible mixture of surprise and uh, relief and just plain happiness that you're not the guy lying there dead. It's somebody else, even though it might be a friend of yours. It's a hard thing to admit to other people for sure. And it's even harder, at least for me, to admit it to myself that Chip died and I didn't. As much as he was a great friend of mine, as much as I was angered and saddened and almost crazy after his death, there was also a part of me that was relieved to be among the living. Just this afternoon, I was reading a new book on World War I, work of nonfiction. I came to the end of it today, and it was about a battle on the Meuse River, separating Germany uh, from France, with three hours left to go in the entire war. It was gonna end. They knew the armistice was coming on November, I think it was 11th. And the night of the 10th, uh, a battalion of American soldiers were, were, were building a bridge, pontoon bridge under fire. Uh, people, Marines and, uh, and army guys both dying and losing their legs, knowing the war would be over in a few hours. They knew it was going to end up, hostilities would cease at 11 uh, in the morning. And yet at nine in the morning, guys were dying and so on for something that was going to end soon. Um, that book kind of echoes how I felt during my whole time in Vietnam, that this thing's going to end and I'm going to go home for sure. I've got a date when you know you're going to go home. Uh, and that sense of, can I make it for one more day? Can I make it for one more day? Can I stay alive and not have my legs lost or die? Was my feeling throughout almost the entire war. 
it was no longer a political feeling, which it had been prior to going. It was just a personal feeling of in the senseless, absurd, we're accomplishing nothing. We weren't winning military objectives. Even the military, West Point kind of people knew we weren't in a military sense accomplishing anything. We were just going in circles as we walked from village to village. And then we'd go back to the same village and then we'd leave it and come back a week later, then a week after that. So what had been a political thing for me before had become a very personal thing of somehow mm -hmm. trying to keep body and soul together uh, for, you know, 10 more days, 10 more hours, you know, 10 more minutes. That was my feeling from the time I got there to the time I left. I think that was different from your war somewhat, that I think you had a sense of accomplishment and of destination and of, of military purpose that uh, we didn't have. Is that true? Um, so, so, so I'll answer that part in a second. I mean, the first thing, my first response as you were talking, Tim, was, was for me not thinking, I mean, I didn't have a chip who did not come home. Right. I did not. You know, my, my friends all came home um, and my soldiers all came home. Um, so for me, that sentiment is more about the people on the other side. Right. So in, in my war back in 1991, something like and I don't know the exact numbers, but something like only 350 Americans were killed, whereas tens of thousands of Iraqis were killed. And, and I've read somewhere somebody I can't remember who this was a writer said something like, um, something that's so one-sided should not be called a war. There should be another word for it, right? And so that's where I come down on. And, and so your, your story about the World War I book, for us, you know, at one point we were told after, you know, four days of combat, a ceasefire is happening in a few hours. And shortly thereafter, we saw more artillery flying over our heads than we had the whole war, it felt like, wow. because the idea was we only have four hours to destroy as much of his army as possible. Mm -hmm. So we know in four hours there is a truce, and yet what right. one reaction of some Americans was was to, you know, to destroy destroy Iraq's capacity to continue to conduct military operations, right? Um, and so th those are sort of my moments more, right? I mean, I mm -hmm. we we talk a lot about um, this. American soldiers sacrifice and being willing to lose a limb or lose a life or whatever. But I think, I think the sacrifice of killing somebody is, is equally profound. Um, I do too. And, and so, and so, I mean, I just, that's, that's where I am. I mean, our wars are different in that regard. Um, certainly. And I don't yeah, know. I mean, you're <laughs> among the things that haunt me are not just my fellow soldiers dying, but there was uh, this little, I, I've told Alex a story and I've written about it but about uh, going across a rice paddy and we got hit on three sides with mortar fire, machine gun fire and rifle fire. And we were out in the middle of a rice paddy and we had nowhere to hide. We, you can't hide in a rice and go into the water, but that's not going to help you much. And uh, we shot back as much as we could from this lasted eight minutes, nine minutes, not very long. It was a, but it was a ferocious firefight. And when it was over, none of us were hurt by some miracle, I don't know how they missed. And uh, as far as I could, as far as we could tell, none of them had been, the, the enemy had been hit. We found no blood trails out in the bushes around us. But as we left that rice paddy, I looked down and there was this dead little girl, maybe 11 years old. You couldn't tell, most of her face was gone. Uh, and I remember looking at her with this sense of, here's this big war going on and this big battle within that big war. And the only casualty that anybody, in any, any of us knew about was this dead little girl. And the responsibility you feel was that my bullet that hit that, I mean, I fired back, everybody did. And it was, did I kill that little girl? You'll never know. War's chaotic and you can't see bullets hit things. Uh, or if you do see it, you don't know if it's your bullet. But I wake up over that at night too, this sense of responsibility. And if you multiply that little girl 
Uh, by 3 million, you get the number of dead Vietnamese in my war. That's a shitload of dead people. And uh, it, it stays with me just as, as it does with you. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere, some people are asking about specific stories of yours, such as the Sweetheart of the Sauntre Bong and, and On the Rainy River um, from the things they carried. Um, and I mean, I know you've talked about how your audience for that book and your audience for, for most of your, most of your uh, war related works is not necessarily veterans. Veterans don't need you telling them right. about the experience, right? That your exactly audience really right. for everybody else, whether they're, so whether true. they're of that generation or the generations. So I guess the question is, and maybe address those two stories since people are asking about them, although in different terms, um, with the things they carry that the, the book, how did you write and what do you remember intentional moves you made to be, you know, to reach the broader audience? What did you do to sort of make it speak to people who have not experienced what you experienced? Well, sw Sweetheart of the Song Trabong, that story in particular was designed explicitly and only for that purpose. Uh, for most women back then, this has changed now where women do serve in the armed forces and sometimes in, in combat roles. Apache pilots and things like that. Uh, but back then, women didn't serve in combat, and I wanted to be inclusive. I wanted women in a story to somehow put their feet inside the boots of a warrior, of a person whose job it is to kill and die, and live in those boots and experience at least a little of what I experienced. Um, women and men are, I suppose, different in numerous ways, but we aren't that different. It's not like women are one species and we're another. We're human and we know what pain is and joy and uh, sacrifice and all, all the whole gamut of human emotions. We, we, we're all human. And I wanted to remind us of that in that story where a woman young woman, basically the age of most of the men who served in Vietnam, fresh out of high school. Uh, most of my fellow soldiers were her age. And most of them came to the war full of the same naivete uh, as this girl shows up uh, in, in Vietnam. And basically what happened to that girl is what happened to all of us. Uh, we were hardened by it all. You, you couldn't help but be. You had to be. Um, you were partly seduced by war. You hated it, and you were terrified of it. But there was also the no denying the awful majesty of combat, the tracer rounds at night, and stick to my memory, the red going out through the night and the explosions and the spooky, the gunship, you know, of just these streams of metal fire coming down at night. Uh, the, the, the napalm, the, the glow of it. It, it, it. You hate it and you're afraid of it, but you're also hypnotized by it. You're spellbound and partly seduced by it. I felt that way in other kinds of ways as well, by an ambush at night, lying in the dark. You're so, there's this prickly awareness of yourself that's seductive. You're, in a way, if you're lying on your couch watching TV, there's not this self-awareness of your lungs taking air in and expelling it. And of your body, there's an awareness of uh, being alive when you're in the presence of imminent death. That's... You, I don't think you can replicate in many, maybe you climbing mountains or something where you're aware of the proximity of death. Uh, that's also seductive. I wanted to have a woman go through it. I wanted to be inclusive. The second thing I should say is that most of the letters I get are not from veterans, just as you said. They don't need to be told what Vietnam was like. They were there. Although a lot of them didn't serve 
in the infantry, they served in other capacities, artillery, uh, uh, clerks, truck drivers, all kinds of things. But you certainly don't now need to inform the veterans of what they had already gone through. But the wives of veterans and the children of veterans and the grandchildren of veterans and the lovers and the mothers and the fathers, because so many veterans fall silent and don't talk about it much, if at all. And it's not always for psychological reasons. Sometimes it's just pure fucking politeness. You don't go to a cocktail party and say, hey, you want to hear about the Gulf War? I mean, they, people would stare at you and, and the, the answer in their eyeballs would be no. But they'd say, oh, yeah, what, what, what's on your mind or something? But it's, it's not polite. There are all kinds of reasons beyond psychological reasons not to talk about it. But the wives of sons, the daughters, and so on of veterans, they're curious. My own kids are curious. Uh, they don't ask many explicit questions, but they do know when I'm having a bad memory, bad time at the dinner table, when I go quiet. Uh, and they recognize it. And there's, there's a kind of unspoken curiosity that was one of the reasons I wrote Dad's Maybe Book. I wanted to speak to what they weren't asking me about, but were aware of. So literature is aimed not just at those who go through an experience, but at those who didn't and want to know about it and want to maybe feel a little bit of it. The same way that I've never been in a concentration camp, when I read Primo Levi, I'm taken to an experience I never had, or Ellie Wiesel. I'm taken somewhere I've never gone, a bad place, uh, a hideous place. But I, I'm curious about how human beings handle tragedy and handle the hideous. Somebody, since you, since you brought your, your sons into this and your son's relationship to a degree to, to your war, um, somebody asked about, for, for both of us, um, as fathers, how has, how has becoming fathers and, and husbands too, um, how is that, I mean, we, we, we think, rightly I think, we think of, of war as a kind of hyper-masculine sort of experience. Um, and how does becoming a father especially, how has that affected our relationship to, to war, our relationship to love, sort of, sort of all of that? Well, you know, if, I don't know how you handle it. I, I have to walk a kind of tightrope act um, when it comes to issues of war and peace. I have my pretty strong opinions, as you know. I think killing people is not a good idea. I don't think it's efficacious. I don't think it works often. Sometimes it does. In your war, it kind of worked. Um, the Iraqi army was expelled from Kuwait. Uh, I wouldn't say it was totally conquered. The army, your, your truce happened too quickly. Uh, subsequent wars happened, of course. I was going to um, say, I mean, but, my, my, my war gave birth to Osama bin Laden, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I know, that's true. It might have been the opposite of efficacious. Yeah, it might have been actually, yeah, you're right. It might have been actually contrary to long-term American interests. It got us engaged in the Middle East, a place where we still are. Uh, but the tightrope I have to walk is I can't preach to my kids. The more you do it, the more they resist. They, they, uh, I didn't like it from my dad when he would try to tell me what to think. And I got to be careful not to do that. And, and I found a technique that works as a father that is instead of making declarations about things to ask questions of the kids. So do you, what what, what, if, whatever they ask me, I just ask them back in different terms. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if, if they say, you know, do you think we ought to, you know, make, go to war over X? I'll ask them about their opinions. Do you think it'll work? Do you, uh, do you think the, the killing people is worth what you win from killing people? Uh, things like that. But we had a discussion maybe three weeks ago at the dinner table 
my wife is right now not here. She's isolating herself uh, in another house. But my, so I'm with my two boys alone temporarily because of COVID. And at the dinner table, one of the boys asked me about Hiroshima. Why did we kill in Hiroshima? You know, I think it was about 70,000 human beings, many of them children, almost none of them combatants. Um, and I, I had an answer for the why, a military answer, uh, and the old Marine answer that, you know, well, we would have lost a million people if we'd attacked, and that would, that's 70,000 uh, dead women and children and old men were worth the price of a million American soldiers dying. But I didn't give that answer. I, I asked them, well, what do you, what, what, what's your opinion about it? And uh, both of them talked for a little bit. They didn't have anything cerebral to say exactly, but they both in different kind of kid language were saying how hideous, how terrible. Couldn't you some, find some other way to end a war than, than killing uh, 70,000 and then I think 50 or 60,000 at Nagasaki. Uh, it, it, so it wasn't cerebral, but it's sort of, it, 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 I, so I, I don't know how you handle talking about this, these things, Alex, but my mine is simply to not say a whole lot, not offer many opinions. Let them, let them do it. You do it. How do you do it? I, I think the same way. Um, I mean, I don't, well, you'll have, you'll have to ask my daughter, <laughs> ask Amy Kay what, what, what I do. She would probably be much more aware than I am. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't try not to preach about things. And I mean, I, she knows how, what I think and feel in general about, about war and these kinds of issues. So it's never a huge topic of conversation. Um, we, she shares the same political persuasion that I do as well. Um, so we don't talk about it a lot, um, but I also, I, I think I don't preach, but she knows what I think. She knows what I feel, I think, about things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me to sort of get, get back to that person's question too. Um, so Anna Kay was born in the spring of 2003. And so, I mean, one of my vivid memories is sitting, you know, sitting in the hospital room, holding her in my arms as an infant. And, you know, the, the U S military had just defeated Iraq and Saddam, Saddam Hussein. And so I'm watching, as I'm holding my new brand new baby in my arms, I am watching, and it was actually my old battalion. I'm watching my old, literally my tank could have been rolling uh -huh. down the streets of Baghdad, but I'm watching while I'm holding my baby. And, you know, eventually they start doing a screen that rolling through the credits. I don't know what it was, CNN, whatever it was, of, of the dead American soldiers at that point. And, and I turned it off. I mean, I'm holding my baby and I, I could have recognized a name, right? Of, of, mm -hmm. Could have been one of my, one of my, one of my old soldiers. So I, I turned yeah. it off. So I mean, in, a very, in a very literal and real way for me, um, fatherhood intervened, if, if that's the right word, right? Kind of, kind of took, over, um, took over my life at that point too. So, so it very much, yeah, changed, changed me. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I barely think of myself as a soldier and veteran. I think of myself as a father, you know, every millisecond of every day. Um, the, the, the other mm -hmm. is, is a whole different version of me. Mm -hmm. I think. So you wrote, you you've been, you talked tonight about some of the, you know, horrible things in general terms you witnessed. Um, you have a lovely expression. There, there's, a, there's a film about, about Tim that's looking for a distributor right now by a guy named Aaron Matthews called The, called the War and Peace of Tim O'Brien documentary. It's largely about the writing of his, of his most recent book, Dad's Maybe Book. Um, and there's a, it's actually a line from one of the interviews I don't think Aaron included in it. But you talk about how the artist's duty is to remove ugliness from the world. Basically, the mm -hmm. measure of the artist is how well he can he can he or she can remove ugliness from the world. Um, and I think it's a fascinating idea when the writer's subject is ugliness, is the ugliness of war, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it seems like that's that's kind of a no pun intended, a catch twenty two. 
right? That you're both trying to, you know, as you, as you talk about the spectacular, almost beautiful imagery of the tracer rounds, mm -hmm. and yet underlying that is 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 our bodies and body parts coming apart, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. How do you how do you? And thankfully, I'm not a fiction writer, so I don't have this particular concern as much. Um, but how do you balance that? You know, that as an artist, your first obligation is the pleasure of the text for the reader in some ways, right? Right. On the other hand, what you're what you're giving, what you're presenting, is totally unpleasurable. <laughs> it's so it's so weird, Alex. I mean, there's a reason you and I have known each other for 17 years. Is that's exactly the subject I wanted to kind of get to. I don't know, a minute and a half ago, that uh, delete ugliness. To me, that refers to deleting lies. That's ugly. Deleting not sort of national narcissism. That's ugly. Uh, there's there's the issue. Some of my books have been banned in some places. Most recently, up in Alaska by some town, but also in Kansas and New York, all kinds of places, banned for using profanity. And to that, to those people, those book banners, the profanity is ugly. So what should you do as a writer? Should you write by some poor fucker who gets shot? in the balls in a war, should he say, oh, poop, I've been shy. Is that what they want? Lying is ugly. Maybe the profanity is too, but it's not as ugly as truthfulness. As best I can, I try to replicate the diction and the idioms and the profanity soldiers utter. There's a line in the things they carried, you know, that if you don't care for obscenity, you don't care for the truth. If you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote. Send guys to war, they're going to come home talking dirty. To me, deleting ugliness means deleting lies. There's that great uh, Wilfred Owen poem, Dulce decorum est, and that it ends with, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the, called the old lie capitalized. And his poetry is, brings a kind of ugliness. That poem in particular is about a guy basically strangling from mustard gas as he's being uh, carried from the field. Uh, yeah, the details are, are ugly, but they're true. Too many Americans want to sanitize war. And you do it with euphemisms. The word war sanitizes war. The word, the word itself. But so too the 4th of July celebrations and Memorial Day celebrations, celebrating our glorious veterans, forgetting about the guys on the other side and the women on the other side, you know, I mean, they made their legs move. They shot back the Viet Cong. Uh, that, that, that poem in particular, and I hope my work too, at least does what art can do to, you can't eradicate the old lie. That's I think impossible, but you can diminish it. You can fight back against it by displaying the nastiness, the relentless nastiness of war, man killing man, as a way of at least fighting back against the euphemisms and the, and the erasure we have when it comes to warfare. Uh, every American after every war should, made to, should be made to like go to Dover, Delaware, or wherever the hell they unload the coffins, open up a coffin and stare at all the dead people, one after the other, for 24 hours till the hangar is, is empty. And then go out and spout your platitudes about the war and how great it is and how much you support it. But go look at that stuff you're celebrating. Don't look away from it, look at it. If you want to celebrate it, look at it. And yet, we don't. You can hear the passion in my, I don't get this passionate often, but 
this this is something that really really hurts me don't hide from the thing if you love war so much or a war go if you think it's so great get off your ass and go to it better yet send your lovely you know 19 year old daughter and your handsome 20 year old son send him if you're so for the war and don't tuck him away at stanford or or uh university of arkansas Yeah. Okay, that, this is the stuff I don't do with my kids. This is called the, this is the, <laughs> this is the stuff I want to say to them that I never I don't really ever say. Right. Maybe Tad's in the next room, my younger son. Maybe you overheard me probably telling one of his friends, "Oh, Dad, Dad just cut loose." Right. Um, earlier, you had said that you know that going moving from the draft to the to the enlisted or to the volunteer force clearly changed the relationship of, of the soldier you know, to, to the military and, and to wars. Um, it also changed the American society's relationship to wars too. You know, I, I have this sort of pet, pet theory, which of course probably has no grounding, but moving to a volunteer force, which in some ways, and, and, and basically telling everybody else, you do not have to serve if you don't want to. I mean, there's something strange in the kind of implicit contract of citizenship that just happens then, right? That suddenly it's less about we automatically. Mm -hmm. It's less about what we all might have to sacrifice. Some, like there's something, something changes when that ultimate burden of citizenship is not even a possibility for every single person unless you ask for it to be. Right. I mean, it right. certainly makes for more professional military, obviously. Right. But, but also it changes, I think, people's relationship to the state and to, and to one another when they are not necessarily subject to mm -hmm. that kind of ultimate bound of, bound of citizenship. Right. Yeah. The all volunteer army also changes in addition to everything that you just said. But, and I agree with every word of it, with what you just said. But it also the, if in the absence of a of universal service of some sort, the wolf is not at the door when it comes to war and peace. You don't have to now. The wolf isn't barking right outside your door here, saying you you might die. It's that that issue is as you just said, it's moot. You don't have to, and that changes the way that we can talk about war and, and discuss war. It's easy to be cerebral and intellectual and talk about national interest and power politics and dominoes falling as they did in Vietnam. The containment of, it's easy uh, to be brave in your rhetoric if you don't have to be brave with your body. It's easier to commit to killing people if you don't have to be killed yourself uh, or your kids don't have to be killed or the, any other loved one that no one that in the, so i i was drafted i hated the draft but i have come now to believe believe in it uh it doesn't have to necessarily be a military draft you can be drafted and maybe do other sorts of things of service to your country uh, but i do and i do now believe in it in a way that i was i was 180 degrees the opposite but it was my life on the line but I've come to believe that it's, it's uh, necessary, especially for a democracy. Authoritarian governments can get away with it, but I'm not sure a democracy can if we don't all have to, uh, to bear the burden. Mm -hmm. we, only have, we only have about a minute left. Um, any final thought or question that you want to put out there for everybody, Tim? Well, I, had a, I had a question for you. Um, <laughs> this is a, this is another lieutenant question. Alex yeah. was an officer. I don't know how many people in our audience even know the difference. And I was not. I was an EM, I mean an enlisted man. And there was a big gulf during my war between officers and EMs. Officers told us what to do, and we basically did it. Or, uh, best, we tried to avoid as much as we could, but we basically did it. Yeah. Did you as an officer ever experience an occasion where you received an order 
from higher up the chain of command to which you objected and or uh, to which you responded by ignoring the order, skirting the order, uh, toning down the order. Did anything ever occur where you thought, God, my humanity is telling me this is not good? So, I mean, the first thing that leaps to mind, I'm, I'm sure there were some, I mean, the first thing that leaps to mind is um, when we first deployed, we, you know, Saddam invaded, Iraq invaded Kuwait on August, August 2nd. My division was the first full division to deploy. We were there by the end of the month with all of our equipment, all of our people, just, you know, fast. Um, we did not have a full complement of soldiers, so they shipped us a bunch of soldiers from elsewhere at the last minute. So I had a platoon sergeant, so my platoon sergeant is, you know, the, the number two person, you know, in the platoon, and, and really in some ways number one person um, in some ways. Um, he was great. He'd been with the platoon since longer than I'd been there. He was fantastic, very competent, but he was one rank less than what you're supposed to be as a platoon sergeant. So they sent me this guy from Fort Knox who was a drill instructor who was absolutely incompetent. And, and you know, as, as the months stretched on, his incompetence and, and frankly, lack of intelligence just became more and more obvious. And so basically, I spent many, many months trying to get him fired. And, you know, it, it, to me, it was a moral affront because if something happened to me, this guy took charge. He took over the platoon. Something happened to me. Right. And, and this guy was just, I mean, he could barely do math. It was, it was phenomenal how, how <laughs> that, that this man had, had was second in command of my platoon. Um, so I spent the entire time trying to get him fired from my commanders. And I just kept, kept, get, kept getting told, no, 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 no. Right. So, so absolutely. And I'm sure there were other issues. That's the one that comes to my mind where yeah, I would just, totally abhorred and disagreed with what I was being told and fought it and fought it and fought it. But in the end, there was nothing I could do, unfortunately. Did, did, did he end up in your tank? Not in my tank, but in my platoon. He had his own tank. Oh, right, right. I oh, got you. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He had his own tank. Yeah. All right. So anyway, so, so I mean, yeah, I mean, as you know, as I think about my friends who stayed in the military, um, that's one of the things I admire actually is the degree to which military professionals can follow orders. I mean, sometimes you have to raise objections. You just have to, right? Um, but often you have to keep silent. You just, you know, you, you do your duty when you disagree and there's something sort of really in some ways admirable about, about what military folks, what folks do and, and, and um, in that regard, absolutely, yeah. So, well, we are now officially over time. Um, we could go on for hours and talk more about writing, but, but we are, we are over. So, so thank you, Tim, for your time tonight. Um, and thank you everybody for, for being with us tonight and for all the questions on the chat. I wish, I'm sorry, I could not have gotten all the, gotten to all the questions. Um, but, but thank you. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for all for being here tonight and everybody have a, have a great rest of your week.